subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. I'm with Mark Tully, a former BBC correspondent, a former BBC bureau chief, not just for India but all of South Asia. He covered the 1971 India-Pakistan war and of course the independence or the birth of Bangladesh, a new nation which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this week. Mark has also been often known as the voice of India. In fact, the Bangladeshi High Commissioner to India, Mr. Mohammed Imran, told me that as a young child in 1971, Mark Tully's voice informed Bangladesh about what was happening in the war between India and Pakistan and all the stories, both brutal and beautiful. Mark Tully, welcome to the print. Thank you very much. <laughs> So this is a photograph of a very young Mark Tully with Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. You can see that they're both uh, under a coconut tree. And Sheikh Mujib, this larger than life uh, gentleman who of course became Bangladesh's first prime minister, now Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the father of Bangladesh. Uh, his 100th birth anniversary is also being celebrated, Mujib Borsho. But our story today is about the independence, the 50th anniversary of the independence of Bangladesh. Mark, you were there. You were a witness to what happened. Tell us about it. Well, uh, I was there part of the time. No one is there all the time. Uh, as, as you know, uh, when all this started, Bangladesh was East Pakistan, the eastern wing of Pakistan. And there had been this uh, anger in the east wing building up every, actually since the partition. The anger was first sparked when Jinnah himself came to Dhaka and said that uh, Urdu would be the language of the East Wing, not Bengali. And that started the language movement, and from there onwards there was movement demanding autonomy and even independence at some stages. The movement uh, in its latter stages was led by Sheikh Mujiba Rahman. I, I always used to call him Sheikh Saab. Uh, others, of course, call him Bangabandhu, father of the nation. He was a great, great orator. And that uh, picture which you've just seen was a picture of Sheikh Saab and I walking down to one of his great rallies. Mm. And that picture was taken after the defeat of the Pakistan army and Sheikh Saab had returned to Dhaka uh, from his imprisonment by, in West Pakistan. Um, and I still recall in my mind uh, that wonderful, great, booming voice. Because as you said, Sheikh Saab was in every sense larger than life. And his voice was one of those senses, definitely. Right. And that great booming voice shouting, coming out saying, Omar Shona Bongra, our golden Bengal. Um, so, but during the actual war, um, I was mainly in London, mm -hmm. but what happened was that uh, when um, the crackdown took place by the Pakistan army, uh, that crackdown followed some 25 days when Sheikh Saab's um, army league uh, um, followers right. were in control of Dhaka, and the Pakistan army was confined to the um, uh, cantonment. Mm. Then came uh, March 1971 and uh, um, the president of Pakistan, Yahya Khan, came to try and break the ba backlog. Break the back. <laughs> Trying to get a breakthrough uh, in the negotiations between Mujib from the East Wing who wanted virtual autonomy, and uh, from Zit Bhutto, who was then the leader of the West Wing, Zulfika Ali Bhutto, right. and he wanted a strong centrist government, and he did not want uh, Bangladesh, the East Wing to enjoy the advantages of being the majority, right. because there were more Much larger bigger, bigger, larger population. Uh, and uh, after t about 10 days of negotiations, uh, it was clear to Z uh, Yaya, the president, that he wasn't going to achieve a breakthrough. And so he left. And the uh, night after, the night he left, uh, the army 
find out from the cantonment and uh, attack the university police line. In Dhaka, this is in Dhaka? In, in Dhaka. So the Pakistani army and the soldiers sort of came out of the cantonment and began to... Yes, I came out of the cantonment and um, uh, killed a lot of people, committed what later was uh, regarded as atrocities, um, uh, particularly in three areas, the university, uh, the police lines, and the uh, Hindu areas of the old city. Right. Um, the army came out and committed these atrocities. So the, the Dhaka University, the police lines, and the old areas where a large Hindu population lived? That's right, okay. yes, yes. Uh, and um, no one might have known about this because all the foreign correspondents were rounded up, or they thought they'd rounded them all up, and thrown out of the country. At the same time, uh, the Bangladesh press, of course, was silenced. Right. Not si they, they didn't want to be silent, but they were silenced. Mm. Um, but one chap called Simon Dring, wor working for the Telegraph. What was his name again, Simon? Simon Dring, okay. working from the Sunday, uh, for the Daily Telegraph in London. Mm -hmm. uh, he hid when the army came searching for him with the help of the Bengali staff. And then um, a couple of days later, uh, he got out in as much disguise as he could, and he went and saw the three places i would mentioned to you. Um, he somehow managed to get out of uh, um, East Pakistan with great uh, luck, as he himself said, with a considerable measure of good luck, and with some kind person giving him her authority to leave the country right. so that he could get on a PAIA flight. And then he published a graphic uh, account of what had happened. Those days? Yeah. So when did you go to uh, Dhaka first? Well, what, what, what happened was, uh, I need to explain a bit more, then I'll, sure. I'll tell you that. Because what then happened was, of course, that we knew that what, was happen what had happened in Dhaka but we were starting to get stories from our stringers and from other sources we had in Dhaka. This is the and BBC? I was in, yeah, uh, uh, in the talks department of the Eastern Service where I worked, which was writing what we call talks or commentaries on the situation in um, East Pakistan from London. Um, uh, we're starting to get some reports of dreadful things happening in the countryside and in other cities. But we didn't know much about this. Then the Pakistan army uh, collected together a lot of West Pakistani journalists and told them to come to Bangladesh and write stories saying everything was absolutely normal, normal there um, and uh, the army was in complete control of the country. So they wrote these stories, but unfortunately for the army, one of them, uh, called Mascarenus, who was actually a Goan of Goan origin, but a Karachi uh, journalist, he went back to London, spoke to Harold Evans, who was the famous editor of the Times of in Sunday Times, spoke to Harold Evans, who was absolutely, uh, uh, you know, bowled over by the stories he told. Uh, and then after with great difficulty getting his wife out of, and family out of Pakistan, uh, he published his report. And this, of course, was an absolutely uh, bombshell right. and completely destroyed the Pakistan army's case, really. Um, so the next thing which was happened was the Pakistan army thought, well, what we had better do is we had better uh, get some uh, reputable Western journalists and say to them, OK, right. you can come here, you can go wherever you like, you can say what you like, there is no censorship. Um, well, then we rely on you to do reliable reporting. Um, why did they do this? I don't know exactly. But what months were these? When, when Western journalists first went June, in. I can't remember the exact month. One of my troubles is that I was not a very good keeper of diaries. 
and I have no record of my dispatches because they're all with the BBC. Uh, but it must have been about May, I think, by now. Um, uh, and uh, they said we could come. I think one of the reasons they wanted us to come, because we wanted us at least to tell the story of terrible massacres which had also taken place by mutineers from the East Bengal Regiment and the Pakistan, East Pakistan police, um, Bengali uh, mutineers, uh, who had committed dreadful atrocities against non-Bengalis living in um, Bangladesh. Mm. So they wanted that side of the story to come out as well, mm. because it hadn't really come out. And I was the good fortune to be one of those journalists. Right. So we were the first people to be allowed to go in there, report freely, uh, and they were as good as their word. Mm. The Pakistan army? Yeah. Okay. So, and then uh, when the war took place in 1971, December, you were in London at the time? I was in London, yes, yeah. What happened was we re re reported the, the situation as we found it. Uh, we reported that quite clearly the Pakistan army had fanned out from its cantonments and other places uh, where it was uh, holed up during the start uh, of the war, in effect, between Bangladeshis and Pakistan army, and just burnt villages um, as they came to them. Uh, it was like sort of sweeping, uh, lighting a fire which swept through whole areas that the Pakistan army passed through as they tried to re-establish their control over the whole country. Um, uh, it was a horrific sight. This, this is what we saw, yes. Uh, and we saw the, uh, um, the, the damage which had been done in West Bengal, in Dhaka as well. Uh, we didn't manage to talk to many people because of, uh, when we end up, went outside Dhaka, mm -hmm. the whole place seemed to be empty. Um, even t small towns had their bazaars burnt down. And uh, the most uh, appalling brutality and callousness of the Pakistan army uh, was what uh, particularly struck us. Um, and I was there with a very legendary um, uh, war correspondent. You probably heard of her, Claire Hollingworth. Well, Claire was there with me and uh, with the others. And uh, Claire was absolutely appalled by what she'd seen. And of course, she'd covered wars uh, all around the world. Um, and um, So this was post the war? Th this, this was post the crackdown, yeah. Okay. Not post the war. Oh, this is post the crackdown when a group of you were allowed in by the Pakistan Yes, Army. yes, oh. yes, that's right, yes. Okay. This was post-crackdown. Um, and we also interviewed people called Biharis, yes, who were the people who had come from mm -hmm. India into Bangladesh and a time of partition, yeah, and were not Bengalis. And they had horrific stories to tell. Um, it was also obvious that the, we were learned that the Pakistan uh, army Bengalis, the East Bengal Regiment, basically, who had mutinied, had put up very strong fights, particularly in Chittagong, for instance. Um, and so the, the whole crackdown, really, had, instead of being a snap operation, which uh, per, perhaps uh, a mixture of um, brutality and creating fear, would uh, silence the people of Bengal. Um, it's actually the beginning of the uprising against the Pakistan army. So the Pakistani army, which allowed you into East Pakistan at the time, so in a sense, that backfired on the Pakistan army because they thought you would come out with sort of positive reports, yes. positive stories, but that, that wasn't the case. No, uh, it, it did back down. Uh, the only thing it can be said, of course, is that we did report the other side of the story. Uh, we reported the massacre, the brutalities committed by the uh, Bengalis uh, on the Biharis. 
the Bengali soldiers. So that side of the story uh, did get reported. And uh, we also uh, told revived memories of the background and of how this had happened and how, uh, how the army had in fact been taking, facing the prospect of virtually having to leave East uh, um, Pakistan if they hadn't taken action. So we told those stories as well. So the Pakistan army was burning and rampaging and pillaging across the villages of yeah. then East Pakistan. Not, Not much pillaging. The villages were too small, too poor. Um, uh, they mainly just uh, coming along setting them on fire, searching for anyone who might be there, possibly shooting anyone they saw, um, looking for um, militants, as they call them, or insurgents, as they call them. Uh, that, that was uh, what we reported, you know. So there wasn't in much to pillage in those days. And you also reported the story of the Bengali soldiers and their horrific treatment of the Biharis, as it were. Yes, yes. People from Bihar, from India, who went to Pakistan yes. in, in East Pakistan in 1947. Yes. But what about the Mukti Bahini at the time? That must have been... Uh, well, the Mukti Bahini had started their actions. I, had the, uh, I was able through uh, um, our stringers to meet uh, a Mukti Bahini, the uh, local Mukti Bahini man in charge of the Mukti Bahini in Dhaka itself. And he told me that they had recently blown up an electricity transmission uh, unit, uh, a transformer unit, and a bridge. And I was able to go and see the bridge had been uh, damaged and report that. Uh, so yes, they, they were starting. And of course, the other thing the army wanted us to report was the Mukti Bahini, uh, because they were claiming that the Mukti Bahini was um, Indian trained, Indian sponsored, and all the rest of it. Um, so it was, when, was it, what did you find? Did you find that they were India trained and India When we, when I talked to them, you know, obviously it's very difficult to find these people. They weren't going to come forward and say, we. But the one I did speak to, of course, he denied this. He said, uh, we live in Bangladesh. Um, but he did say, we uh, go across the border for some time when we need refuge, when people are, when we're being chased by the army, you know. Um, but this was the beginning of the whole thing, really, still, you know. Um, but that was the other angle that the pa Pakistani army wanted. Uh, uh, they wanted to convey the fact that, in effect, India was declaring war on, on Pakistan. Um, and I can't, to be honest, remember to what extent we discovered that, that was true or not at that stage. Well, subsequently, of course, it has come out that India was involved uh, with the Mukti Bahini, but it, you know, it's also true that not also true, but it is primarily true that it was the Bangladeshis or the East Pakistanis at that time who sort of revolted against yeah, oh, the, yeah. the government. The, the insurgency started um, with the revolt of the Pakistan army, uh, Bangladesh, uh, uh, Bengali regiments, the East Bengal regiment battalions, mm. and also with the police as well. Who, who muted it and ran away. Were there, were there many women in, on the streets in Dhaka or was it just this ghost town? Uh, in my memory, there were very few people on the streets. People were, were frightened still. Um, uh, I, I don't remember particularly seeing women. And in the countryside, it was as though there was no one there at all, basically. And we were never able to make out uh, um, what, uh, where they had all gone, to be really yeah. honest, you know. Um, I was told by uh, my main source of income, uh, information was our two stringers we had there. Right. One was called Atash Samad, who worked mainly for the Bengali service, and one was called Nizamuddin, funnily enough, which is the same as where we're doing this interview. That's right. And where I happened to live. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, and, but of course, I had to be very careful about using any information they gave uh, because the army would have been on them in no time uh, if they'd uh, uh, thought that, that, you know, they were informing us. And in the end, m much further down the line, sadly, Nizamuddin was killed. And he was killed by people called Razakas. And the Razakas were people uh, of non-Bengali origin living in Bangladesh who had been recruited by the army to, uh, to uh, do whatever harm they could to Bengalis and particularly to the Bengali elite. And there was a famous massacre of intellectuals in which sadly Nizamuddin lost his life. So you have a book uh, um, with you, Mark. What's that about? Well, this this book uh, is about one of my... Do you want to show us the cover of the book? Yes, 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 certainly. This book is... Uh, Witness to Surrender yes. by Sadiq Salik. Yes. And Sadiq Salik uh, was an army PRO. At the time, he was Major Salik. And uh, he was in charge of the... Pakistan Army's public relations. This is in 1971. Yes. And as you will, uh, if you ever read this book, and I strongly recommend you, if you're interested in this subject, to read it. Um, he uh, uh, was in the headquarters all the time. There's all sorts of details about how the army um, uh, worked and what happened, or what happened when they found out how the brutal and the brutality of their attacks on the villages and that sort of thing. And it's a very frank book and a very critical of the army. The extraordinary thing about it is that Salik, uh, well, two extraordinary things. Although, of course, Salik didn't like what I was doing, didn't like the BBC or anything like that, um, he wrote this book. Uh, he was not sacked from the army. I, I don't know why. He then went on to be Zia, President Zia al-Haq's PRO, and was killed with Zia when Zia's aeroplane exploded. In 1988. Yeah, and during all those years, from Dhaka right up to the death of Zia, I was in a way working with Saleh. Mm -hmm. And I remember one particular occasion when we had a real ding-dong battle because I got information that um, uh, Bhutto was going to be hanged the next day. His trial was over and everything. And I put out the story. And I got a phone call from Salik. And he was really angry. And he said, this, this story is rubbish. It's completely untrue. Yes. So I said to him, Salik Sam, uh, I'm very happy to put out your denial uh, in your name. And he said, you can't put my name there. And I said, Salik Saab, I can't say I heard it in the sky or something like that. Um, yeah. I have to put your name. Hmm. And in the end, after a lot of battling, I just put the phone down. Hmm. And uh, it is an awful thing to say, terrible thing to say. But I have to admit to you that the next morning, when I got up very early and went down to Pakistan to jail, uh, it was dark and we'd been told that under the law of Pakistan, Bhutto, nobody should be hanged in the dark. They had to be hanged in daylight. And we went down, the party of us, early on, uh, about two o'clock in the morning, and we met a policeman who was patrolling outside the jail. And we said to him, has anything happened here? And he just said, something dreadful has happened here, and walked off. So we knew that Bhutto had been hanged. So this is Rabal Pindi, yes. 1979, April 4th. Yes. And uh, as I said to you, uh, I have to admit that there was something of a, I felt something of a sense of relief uh, because I would have really been in trouble uh, if they had changed their minds or something like that. Right. So that, that was starting when I'm in a relationship. Yeah. And it was really a love-haste relationship because we had a great deal of friendship between each other as well. And I really admire Salik uh, for writing this book because he uh, put his whole career at risk, risked uh, 
the wrath and anger of all his colleagues in the army, the anger of the loyal Pakistanis and all the rest of it. But if you just listen to this, um, you, you will realize the honesty with which he told this story. He tells the story of a meeting an officer after a clearing operation. And this was a clearing operation which took place because he had been given some, some information. The information was not properly checked. So a clearing operation took place. And when the clearing operation, uh, Salik said, when he came back, he said, in the evening, I met the officer who carried out the attack. And what he said was enough to chill my blood. He confided, there are no rebels and no weapons, only poor country folk, mostly women and old men, got roasted in the barrage of fire. It is a pity that the operation was launched without proper intelligence. I will carry this burden on my conscience for the rest of my life. So that's a Salik book. And he was uh, a remarkable man. So Pakistani army man with a conscience. Yes. Yes, yeah. So he was witness to the massacres across yes. Bangladesh or then East Pakistan yes. and he wrote about them so that the world would know that this yes. is what had happened. Yes. But he continued to serve the same Pakistan army. Yes, and he started writing in 76 So the book was published in 77. Um, and uh, he, he was a remarkable guy and I was really sad when I heard that, that he had died. Right. So now, Mark, let's come to the 1971 war. Yeah. Uh, you were in London at the time. You said you, you weren't obviously on the field in uh, Bangladesh or in East Pakistan. Were there any foreign correspondents there? As far as I remember, Jyoti, and I wouldn't uh, guarantee this, no. I mean, the vast majority, well, of course, there were people went in with the Indian Army, yes. you know. Um, uh, but as far as I know, there were no foreign correspondents with the Pakistan army. Uh, but I, I may be wrong there. I, I should know because my job was really to collect all the reports which were coming in and building them into what we called a talk or a commentary right. to be broadcast on the BBC World Service. Um, so then when you went in, this is after the war has been won by yeah. India and a new state or a new country called Bangladesh has been created. Yes. Um, I remember the big concert for Bangladesh. Yes. And of course, that was in, in the West, in London, and Janis Joplin and all these wonderful singers. But then you went back yes. to Dhaka. Yes. And tell us what you saw. Well, I, I, went, I went back to Dhaka. Uh, and of course, the place was uh, absolutely... Well, the streets were flooded, there were people everywhere, there were celebrations everywhere. Um, and Sheikh Mujib had just got back when I, when I arrived there. Um, and uh, of course he was ecstatic. And uh, I uh, approached his PRL and he sa said, I, could I have an interview with him? And he said, you have an interview with him? He wants you to go and interview him. So this is when you met Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. When I met him, yeah. there we were going down to one of his rallies together. Um, oh, you see, my... You're really handsome here, Mark. Yes, <laughs> uh, but I don't. With a, with a shirt and tie in the heat of Bangladesh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the winter. <laughs> yes, it was. Certainly more formally dressed than I am today. And my apologies to you for not dressing more formally. No, no, no. We're all journalists. Uh, uh, um, uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Mujib, um, uh, of course, and lots of people in Bangladesh, the only source of information they'd been getting, really, was the BBC, Bengali, and English language services. And as it happened, of course, as the person who was collecting information each day and writing that up, uh, my name uh, was broadcast almost every day. So I was a hugely familiar figure to them. Right. And I remember my interview with Sheikh Saab. Um, he kept on thanking me for all that I had done for Bangladesh. 
And of course, as you know, as a journalist, I had to keep on saying to the up, we were only doing our job. We were only reporting the news. I haven't done anything for Bangladesh particularly. In the end, uh, he said, what's the fact of, uh, we, we all think you have done a lot for Bangladesh, and I want to present you with a, a, a token of this. So uh, I said, uh, well, uh, uh, I'm not allowed to accept a presence. Mm. Um, so he said, well, you are going to present, uh, accept this picture. And it's a picture of a water river scene in Bangladesh, a lovely picture. And uh, then the argument went on about this with me saying, no, no, I can't accept them. He <laughs> said, yes, you can, you accept it. Tell them it's from me. Yeah. You know? In the end, I said to him, well, I've got no idea, so. Uh, in, back in Delhi, um, I have a BBC office, and it's right above the flat where I live. Right. Um, and so I will put the picture there, and I will tell my seniors, my uh, the officials over uh, head of, uh, on top of me, that this is uh, uh, the property of the BBC office, right. not mine. So then you were in the new Bangladesh. Yes. What was what is your dominant memory of the time? My dominant memory was of the Mitty Shakes arm, actually, and of the sheer pleasure of it. And Do you remember warmth, Hasina, the, or the two girls, the, Hasina and Rehana? No, 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 no. Uh, and of course, doing lots of uh, uh, quite quite a lot of reporting, finding out what happens, filling in gaps, meeting our stringer, all that sort of thing as well. You know. Right. Um, but uh, we weren't. So you went in with the Indian Army after the surrender of Dhaka? No, 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 no. I flew to Dhaka. Okay. Uh, no. And I can't remember how I flew, but I flew there, you know. So when you went into Bangladesh after the surrender of Dhaka, did you meet the Indian generals who were part of the surrender at the time? Uh, I, to be honest, I don't remember. My whole memory is clouded by the memory of meeting Sheikh Sabah, he's a, a fashion and... Uh, so he was this really, this larger than life character. Yeah, and he's who, huge. Who filled up a room, I guess. Yes, yes. And the country. And I kept in touch with Sheikh Saab. Um, whenever I went to Bangladesh, he would give me an interview. And I remember um, with sadness the interview I did with him after he announced the constitutional changes. And I, uh, you know, the way that as journalists you do sometimes presume to give advice to That's people, right. which I suppose one ought not to do. Absolutely. But I was giving him advice and telling him that it's wrong that you've done, you will, you will regret this in the end and think back to all the affection and popularity you had then. Um, so I, I, I kept in touch with, with him as well. So in 1975, when he was assassinated, yes. You were in Delhi at the time. No, I was in London. Um, uh, uh, I was in London because that was the emergency. That's right. And if you remember rightly, I had been expelled of from India. Absolutely. The emergency was imposed in June 1975, and this was a, on the 15th of August, yes. a couple of months later, when he was assassinated. Yes. So yes. you were in London. Did you fly to, did you go to Bangladesh at the time? No, I didn't know. No, because there were other people in the area, you see, by then. Uh, there was a, a correspondent who was responsible. A chap called Brian Barron uh, was uh, responsible for Bangladesh. Um, so I did my old job, really, of... Uh, I wrote commentaries about it based on my past knowledge yeah. and on the information which we, give, we were getting, you know. So 50 years on, Mark, what's, you know, it's, it's been 50 years and long journey, a very young country. But I have, my, my question to you is that, that Pakistan and Bangladesh still have a very bitter relationship. I mean, the Pakistanis don't even want to talk about what happened in 1971. I mean, perhaps they should all read Siddiq Saleh's book. But why do you think that the Pakistanis are refusing to come to terms with it? 
Well, I think it's understandable. Uh, I mean, what would you think as an Indian if, uh, for instance, Kashmir was taken off you, you know? Half the country was lost. The whole concept of a Muslim uh, homeland for the Muslims of the subcontinent was undermined. It was shown that Islam alone is not enough to hold the country together. Um, it was an utter, utter humiliation for the Pakistan army. And the Pakistan army is such an integral part of Pakistan. Uh, imagine what the Indian army would feel like if they had, I haven't only, I don't remember how many, but a vast number uh, of soldiers, including very senior officers, taken war or prisoners of war. What would you feel? That's a huge scar to be left uh, on a nation, isn't it? Um, and, and I think, uh, for what it's worth, um, I think that what happened in East Pakistan, in a sense, puts a burden of generosity on India. I think India should at least, under, and Indians should understand uh, the utter terrible disaster it was to Pakistan. Um, and therefore, um, I just wish that India could find a way of bearing this burden of generosity and the relationship between India and Pakistan uh, could uh, at last improve on a stable basis. And if that happened, as I just said, then relations between Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, would also, I'm sure, as a follow-on. And this whole South Asia, uh, which really um, is far more backward than it need to be, uh, the whole of it would radically improve for the better because around the world it has been shown that the value of regional trade right. has been shown. So let's go back to 1972 and I want to take you to Shimla when the agreement was signed between Indira Gandhi and Zulf Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. Um, now, the same Bhutto who's hanging you, of course, the story of which you broke. But in 1972 in Shimla, don't you think that India bore the burden of generosity at the time and returned 93,000 prisoners of war to Pakistan? Uh, I, I think India was in a dilemma. Uh, I think, don't think they knew what to do with them. What, what would you do with all those prisoners of war, you know? Um, uh, you know, uh, the whole course of the similar summit, the ending of it, you remember, with Bhutto saying it's all over, and then last minute, uh, Indra changing his mind and uh, the agreement for the soldiers to go back. Um, Indra also knew that if she held on to the soldiers, it would be the end of Bhutto probably in Pakistan. And she feared that that would mean the return of the army in some form or in Pakistan. It wasn't a straightforward uh, act of generosity. There was a, a very strong convenience uh, element in it as, as well. Um, Were you in Shimla? Yes, I was. Yes, yeah. And uh, I, I remember uh, vividly filing the story saying Bhutto says it's all over and then being summoned to go back and be told that they'd signed an agreement and late at night filing the story that there had been um, an agreement. So Bhutto, Bhutto did stand up to Indira Oh, yes, 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 definitely, yes, yes, yes. And he was, you know, his country had lost the war, the country had been broken up into two, but he had the, but he had the courage or the machismo, if you like, he stood up to this woman. Yes, uh, but in a way, also, there's an element of desperation in it, of course, because as I said, if he went back with nothing done for the prisoners of war, uh, about the prisoners of war, or if he'd went back, gone back with a more major concession on Kashmir, uh, where would he have been, you know? He'd have been finished. Um, so it was like that. I don't want to give the impression that uh, there was no, uh, I mean, what, what, what was achieved was a compromise. And I think, I, I firmly believe, and I've often said that, that compromises 
are often very valuable things. They're thought of as being a very bad thing, or being cowardly or that something like that. But very often, and Mahatma Gandhi said this, uh, it is a compromise which is really the answer. And I think there have been other stages in the India and Pakistan relationship where, with more generosity, I think Siachen. Uh, so Indira Gandhi. So Indira Gandhi did compromise yes. with the with the country that she went to war with yeah. and defeated, mm. but compromised and said, "Okay, let's take. You know, you you should take back your people yeah. and let's start again." Yeah. Did you meet Indira? Yeah, I, I can't remember what I did on that occasion. Uh, um, I, I, it would only be a press conference if I did. I saw Butter at a press conference, definitely, I remember, you know. Um, but I don't remember when I saw Indira on that. So what was the image at the time of Indira Gandhi? You know, in, in India, of course, uh, she was sort of known as Durga, you know, Atal Bihari Vajpayee's famous description of her. Yes. But as a foreign correspondent or then as the, you know, as a BBC correspondent? Uh, well, I, I certainly thought she was a very tough woman. I thought she had handled the whole crisis uh, leading up very well. I thought her decision not to rush in uh, was, was a very wise decision. Um, and um, I, I thought that she would now be in a very strong position to do things which needed to be done um, in, in, uh, in India, which she was now uh, um, undoubted, undisputed uh, leader of India. Yeah. And so last couple of questions, Mark, if you look at Bangladesh today, Sheikh Hasina, the daughter of your good friend, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, is running the country, very strong, very pow powerful woman. Yeah. She's come back with a huge majority. Yeah. What do, you, what do you make of Bangladesh today? What are your, your thoughts? Well, you know, having seen the state of Bangladesh when, the, when um, Kissinger famously described it as a basket case, having been out in Bangladesh after the end of the war, seen the bridges destroyed, the power, the power, power pylons destroyed, um, seeing the roads in an appalling condition, um, seeing the, uh, the famine which broke out in Bangladesh as well, um, seeing how that famine spread into West Bengal, seeing people literally dying on the streets of West Bengal as well as uh, uh, Bangladesh in the rural areas. Um, I am absolutely delighted that Bangladesh is now making such economic progress. Right. Um, I, I'm delighted that its uh, human uh, index of human development figures are, are mounting. Um, I'm delighted that there seems to be stability. Um, but uh, I was invited to go there for the celebrations, but because of COVID, um, uh, I uh, decided I would stay at home. But your message was read out, I know, at the brigade, uh, at the parade ground, at the inaugural. But, you know, to, you, you speak about Kissinger, who called, infamously called Bangladesh a basket case. And in fact, when, uh, when thousands or lakhs of Bangladeshi refugees or East Pakistanis were, were flooding Bengal, West Bengal are coming into India at the time and and um, Indira Gandhi was so upset or angry with, with Nixon and with Kissinger at the time. What are your memories of that? Well, I, I remember her as being extremely hostile to America. And of course, I remember her signing the Treaty of Friendship with Russia. And uh, it was a very clever international movement. And many people believe uh, that's what uh, held the Seventh Fleet back, which was, uh, uh, as you know, moved into basically the area. Um, but, uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, I think that poisoned Indian and American relationships for, for a long time. Mm. In, 
a story that I um, that I wrote, of course, many years later was about K. Subramaniam, uh, the father of the current external affairs minister, yes, Jay yes. Shankar, who met Kissinger at the time and reminded Kissinger that he should, of all people, understand what happened in 1971 as all these millions of refugees were streaming into India because of his own memory of the Holocaust in Germany. And, uh, and, and I think this sort of tilt towards Pakistan that the U.S. had was, um, and, and I'm not sure Kissinger liked that very much, but this story was told to me by Mr. Subramaniam himself. <laughs> but this is also American policy. <laughs> Yes. The, the only thing uh, which uh, saddens me about Bangladesh today um, is that the reports I get of an oppressive policy towards the media. Um, and I don't think a woman as powerful and as competent and uh, as uh, politically stable as Sheikh Hasina uh, needs to be uh, obsessive, um, oppressive about the press. I think that's a great pity. So, well, we hope that Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is listening to what you say and has watched this interview. But Sir Mark Tali, thank you so much for your time, for speaking to the print. And like I said at the beginning of this interview, you were known as the voice of India, but perhaps you were also the voice of South Asia. And I'm going to leave my viewers with this amazing picture again of Mark with Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Thank you so much, Mark, for thank this. You, for thank this you for being interested in something that's happened a long time ago.